Today we're going to extract tube 22, which has become a mobile after root resorption post ortho. Um, the bone recession or bone loss is both vertical as well as from the facial uh, buckle area, and that's where we'll need to graph. We have lost facial plate, and these cases tend to be a little bit more difficult in terms of providing uh, long term aesthetics and not making the root look too long. Uh, again, essentially avoiding an FP2, FP3 case and trying to maintain it as an FP1. Um, so shortly we'll start this procedure. So as you can see, tooth 2 here has class 3 mobility and as well as being depressible in the apical direction. We're pushing a tooth to the labia, we'll actually see the opening between the gingival margin and what's left of the crown of the tooth. The root is now being resorbed. Our biggest concern is the loss of the spatial plate, which you can see here basically completely collected in. We'll see that much more when we extract a tooth as to how I will rebuild that for Chris and make that look as aesthetic as possible. Just as a note in the future, this tooth will probably go down the same road. Uh, and at some point we might want to get to it before it at gets to this At this point we're just rotating the tooth as the periosteal the elevator. There's really not a lot of holding in here and there's no real risk of fracturing any facial plate because that's essentially gone. So it's going to be just basically a quick twist and remove which you shall do right now. And then we'll be able to identify the amount of damage. Typically there's a lot of connective granula granulation tissue under these types of teeth. They're kind of similar to external root resorption cases. So we're at this point we're just gonna cure out all of this tissue out and then we'll very carefully push forward on the facial tissue, the gingival margin here to see how far uh, down the facial plate loss goes. Soft tissue. I tend to use actually a round curette to do that. It allows me to feel the buccal facial plate as it tends to curve in. You can see the cleft, how severe it is in that area, and when I push it out, that's what I want to attain. So we're going to slide in our acellular dermal membrane on the facial plate, then put our graft material behind it, and then flip it over. What I use to hold it, you want to touch the valve, please, again? Right there. You can see the defect where the root was here. What I use is basically pinning it between the existing periosteum and the actual bone itself, so we tend to elevate that tissue. You can use a number of different retractors to do this. I just tend to prefer the round excavator here to do that. So once we get this prepared, our next step you'll see with placing of the membrane and preparing of the bone graft material itself. The alloderm me some of your dermal matrix. I've just already trimmed most of it, and it's going to, as you can see, it's going to have plenty to cover the facial aspect. And it'll tuck right underneath there. A little bit of a smooth trim in approximately. You don't want to leave this tissue right against the tooth, of course. It's all going to be tucked underneath. And then move the back there that this has been sitting for 10 minutes. And so I'll section the head again. So next we're going to place this in the forward flap that I've created. So I'm using a combination of Dynagraph 2, Pepgen 15, autogenous bone. We've mixed that all together sterilely. We're now placing it in the delivery system. I prefer to actually have this delivery system. It allows me to use a little hydraulic pressure in placing the material so that it flows where I want it to. So we put it in the bone injection syringe. I have already uh, treated the area ready to take the, the graft using the process called RAP or regional accelerator phenomenon, which is Again, another niche term, which just basically means perforating the cortical plate of the bone and allowing a greater flow, uh, inflow of uh, bone progenitor cells. So that's been done already. I placed the membrane. Where's our little instrument with my membrane placing instrument, which is really nice to have. You can see the tip, for a sharp tip that allows you to grab the membrane in a very fine, uh, flat blade to bring it down along the facial plate as well. So the membrane is ready. We're now going to place the graft, the bone graft in the site. Great. So here we have the membrane placed. I've already tucked it in between the mucosa and the facial plate. And the void that we want to fill on the facial area is right there. And again, because I have this in my injection system, I can put the material right where I want to, nicely like that. Now, of course, Dynagraph 2 has the advantage of becoming, at body temperature, a little more firm. So we can, again, then hydraulically compact that with an instrument that's familiar to you, such as an amalgam condenser. 
you so choose. And you'll start to see how the facial mucosa is starting to fill out as we pack this in. You have to be careful that it's not sloppy at all. We'll now be able to rotate the flap and tuck it in on the lingual aspect where I have already created a space for this flap to tuck under. And you can see by virtue of that hydraulic compaction the natural curvature and anatomy being restored to the facial mucosa. Of the graft site now using 4-0 Vicro sutures uh, actually immobilizing the, um, our alloderm is critical to its success. Uh, if the edges pop open then material will fall into the bone graft site and of course will lessen our bone graft. So I actually use a combination of cross mattress sutures uh, as well as periacral along the margins and I'll coat this. And on top of this I will then place a pressure on the lingual to make sure that all of our dynagraph tools on the facial will place, will start to warm. And then I will cover this entire area with barricade, which is a light cure resin. I tend to prefer it allows me just to hold a little extra pressure and keep everything off from sneaking in between the actual alloderm graft and the existing mucosa tissue. It takes about 12 to 24 hours to actually get a, um, a fibrin clot or a fibroblast crossing that, um, that chasm, if you want to call it that. And that, once we get that happening, then we're a little bit more impervious to underlying or damage to the underlying graft material. So that's why I like to cover this with a material that protects it. And we'll show that in the final uh, in the final situation. So Zell and I are just carrying the barricade here. Again, my material preference. This was actually taken off the market for a while. I think it was too expensive. A lot of guys didn't buy it, but when they took it off the market, I think a select number of people complained and they brought it back on. So there you can see it's nice and firm now, kind of pink looking. Uh, we've left most of the pressure. Chris, just bite together for me. So that when you bite and open again, if there's any pressure brought to bear, it'll be pushing the graft in a labial direction, which is what we're trying to plump out here. And I've left that a little bit open, so there's a little bit of room, but lots of protection. And again, you can see our mattress sling sutures, as well as the periacral. that periacral coating on top of everything. So. It's really well secured. We're going to take a look at this uh, post-operatively in a couple of days and next week as well. I like to follow these up quite carefully. So that's it for our ridge maintenance graft procedure.